Yeah, well, uh, communicative competence is actually a response to the concept of linguistic competence, which arose at the end of the 1950s and early 60s. And the idea of linguistic competence is that you, cr you, you construct the ability to make well-formed sentences. And the interesting thing about linguistic competence is that it's not cultural at all. Under normal circumstances, any child is supposed to be able to construct well-formed utterances in his or her mother tongue, quite naturally. Uh, so this was a kind of culture-free approach to language acquisition. But in the early 1960s, people said, well, it, there's also a, a kind of cultural competence that children and learners need to acquire. It's not just constructing well-made utterances, it's also knowing how to use them. And this brings culture back into the spotlight and it brings society back into the spotlight because there are social rules and social conventions whereby we use these well-formed utterances. Uh, so you've got to know, is it a request? Is the utterance uh, a suggestion? Uh, if somebody pays you a compliment, how do you respond? And that's quite an interesting one because people respond differently in different speech communities and cultures. If somebody says, that's a beautiful dress that you're wearing, uh, how do you respond? Uh, you can either say, <laughs> The, the, the British response is, uh, no, it's not. I got it in a secondhand shop. It, you, so you deny the compliment or you disavow responsibility for it. You say, oh, no, it's, it's, it's a, it was a Christmas gift. It's very nice, but it was a Christmas. So you, you, you downplay the compliment and that is the conventional response. Here in South America, you simply say, yeah, it's gorgeous, isn't it? Uh, so you acknowledge the compliment, gracious. Um, <laughs> And if you meet, as I have, uh, people who have different complementing and responding styles, then there's a kind of interesting miscommunication goes on. And there's a different set of expectations governing the, governing the complement and the response. So knowing how different cultures and different speech communities give compliments, respond to compliments, give insults, respond to insults, uh, this is part of communicative competence. It's the social rules governing utterances. I've been spending much of my career looking at intercultural communicative competence, uh, which is a much more recent concept. It began to be developed around the 1980s, 1990s, about 20 years after communicative competence began to be established. The things about linguistic competence and communicative competence is you're taking your norms from the parent speech community. So if you're learning English, if you're learning French, you're asking yourself, how do French people respond to compliments? How do English speaking people respond to compliments. And if you're learning a language, you're taking your rules, you're taking your cues from the speech community. And you're saying that is, that is normative behavior within the speech community. That is uh, authenticating or legitimizing, if you like, the rules. So you learn how to give and receive compliments in the target speech community. But increasingly in the late 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, people who are speaking languages are doing it without reference, especially English, without reference to uh, the Anglophone speech community. So in a multinational working group, you might have uh, Asians, Middle Eastern uh, people, Africans, continental Europeans, Latin Americans, no British people, no Americans, but they all might be using English as the uh, lingua franca. So why should they use the social conventions of the Anglophone speech community to govern their rules of communicative competence? What they actually need to do, we suggest, is that they need actually to step back, observe the rules that are developing in the kind of the small C culture of the working group. They need to be open to difference in the group, observant of behaviors in the group, and they need to work out, if you like, their own rules for communicating effectively within that, within that group. So they're basically making up the rules that will function in an intercultural environment. And the ability to do that, the knowledge and the skills and the qualities to do that are what we understand by intercultural communicative competence. So you're not taking the rules of the, if you like, the, the original speech community as normative. You're taking the uh, the contingent rules of the people who are in the situation, crossing cultures as your situation, 
and you're creating rules that will work for that group. It's a good question. I mean, all intercultural dialogue is what you hope will happen when communicators who have intercultural communicative competence interact. So there are certain things that are supposed to characterize effective intercultural dialogue. So you'll get things like openness and respectfulness to diversity, whatever kind of diversity it might be. It might be religious, it might be ethnic, it might be racial, it might be a gender orientation. So it's uh, intercultural di dialogue is marked by respect for diversity and otherness. It's marked by a capacity to listen to the other person's perspective mindfully and to be open to, be, to, to change and transformation as a response to listening. Uh, it's marked by a desire to cooperate towards um, commonly defined goals. So it's participatory and it's usually goal-oriented intercultural dialogue. So people from diverse backgrounds can still establish and move towards common goals despite their dis differences. Um, there's the, also it's supposed to be characterized by the possibility of transformation and personal growth. Many people don't want to transform. Many people are closed to growth. They don't want to change. But if you're engaged with intercultural dialogue, then you have to be at least open to the possibility of change. So it can be a scary thing. It can be undermining of the self, but you have to build up the personal resources and qualities that will help you cope with that process of growth and change. And finally, uh, intercultural dialogue is supposed to be characterized by the ethical quality of respect for the other. So intercultural dialogue is what happens when people who can do it, <laughs> who have these qualities uh, of intercultural communicative competence, come together and they communicate effectively. One of the things that I haven't mentioned, which I think is, 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 has been more and more uh, on my mind is resilience because uh, very often in intercultural dialogue things can go wrong and they, they will go wrong. So being able to have the resilience to say I want to cope with that set of communication misfires, learn from it, analyze it and do it better the next time, that I think also is part of intercultural communicative competence that will make intercultural dialogue more effective. Yeah, well, intercultural language education is basically what I do. So with intercultural language education, you're trying to train people, usually in my case, language learners. It can be different people. It could be uh, business people. It could be people who are working in NGOs together. Uh, it could be people who are going out on um, student exchanges. But in my case, it's language learners. And you're trying to, uh, you're trying to develop intercultural communicative competence in those learners so that they can engage in intercultural dialogues. So intercultural language education is trying to get people to become, to develop intercultural communicative competence. It's usually experiential. It's usually task-based. Uh, it might involve things like critical incidents and critical in incident analysis. Uh, it might involve um, drama, for example. There is something called theater of the oppressed, which is very popular here in South America, where you take drama situations and you work through them repetitively, analyzing them as you go along. Uh, and they usually bring to the surface the kinds of values, the kinds of differences, the kinds of context of otherness that might cause uh, communicative misfires and perhaps even conflict. So in the safe space of the classroom, in the safe space of the educational environment, you allow people to make mistakes, learn from those mistakes, develop the resilience, develop the personal qualities and skills of intercultural communicative competence in the hope that they will transfer those skills into other situations where intercultural dialogue is necessary. So intercultural, uh, intercultural language education is a set of techniques, a set of educational processes, all of which are geared towards uh, trying to develop intercultural communicative competence. Yeah, that's a very, very good question. Uh, telecollaboration does predate COVID-19. Um, telecollaboration started as soon as, almost as soon as digital networking started in the 1990s, the early uh, adopters were doing it. I've been doing it for the past 16 years and I've been working with people here in Brazil 
but also around the world, Taiwan, Argentina, uh, Europe. Um, so, so it has been going on for a while. But I think two things um, I'm finding over the course of this rather difficult year. Uh, one is that uh, more people are obviously being forced online as we are just now. So we're spending much more time interacting on our screens. And so teachers who in the past might have said, oh, I, I don't have time to learn to do that, are now forced into the situation where they're interacting with the technology. And many of them are saying, oh, I don't like this. And many of them are saying, oh, this is actually quite interesting. <laughs> and they're becoming more confident with the platforms, with the technology and the techniques. So you're getting a wider base of teachers who are more comfortable with the technology. And I think more inclined to experiment with forms of uh, telecollaboration. So I think what I'm gonna see in the future, what we're all gonna see in the future is an expanse of uh, the technology that's used to deliver telecollaboration. I think we're gonna become more creative as we become more uh, comfortable with the technology that uses it. The second thing is because we're stuck, because you're stuck in Delaware and I'm stuck in Sao Paulo, I'm actually teaching in China, but living in Brazil, which, uh, you know, like 30 years ago, this would, would have been like a, a miracle, it would have been magical. Uh, but this is our everyday reality. But because everyday travel is now more difficult, but because internationalization is so important, particularly in higher education, uh, we're, be, we're looking at virtual travel, virtual intercultural dialogue as being one way to give learners, students, an experience of otherness. I tend to agree with you. It's not actually as good as being dumped into another country and having to cope with it. There'll always be a place one hopes it'll come back, corporeal travel. Uh, but I think we're learning and, and more and more people are now engaged with the process of bring, bringing together people in intercultural online exchanges and giving people that context for their experience of otherness and the possibility of developing intercultural communicative competence through that online dialogue. It's not easy. Anybody who is involved in a telecollaboration will tell you that there are challenges and there are conflicts. Uh, anything that happens in real life also happens online. Any disagreement <laughs> that happens in real life also happens online. Any territoriality uh, that happens will also happen online. So online, you simply recreate to some extent the conditions of being offline. But it is uh, a way of engaging a large number of people um, in intercultural dialogue. And for me, it's always been a magical way or potentially a magical way of giving people that very precious experience uh, so that we can, I hope, learn and grow from, from those uh, encounters. So I think just be, there'll be an explosion of, or an even greater explosion of interest and telecollaboration as a, as a result of the pandemic.